Hello, and welcome to Autocracy Now. In this episode, Stalin transforms the Soviet economy. We left off last time with Stalin essentially in control of the Soviet Union. Lenin had died, and subsequently, Stalin had started off on the process of deifying him, treating him like a god for political purposes, idolising his memory, and encouraging his personality cult. Now, Lenin himself actually predicted this. He said, quote, After their death, attempts are made to convert revolutionaries into harmless icons, to canonise them, so to say, and to hallow their names to a certain extent for the consolation of the oppressed classes, and with the object of duping the latter. End quote. So he knew exactly what Stalin was about, but of course this was one of the many things that people never talked about. By 1927, Trotsky, Zinoviev and Kamenev, some of his key rivals, had been expelled from positions of power and authority in the party. Stalin was clearly in the ascendancy, and had begun to install his cronies in positions of power. Civil war and unrest had died down significantly. The economy was gradually recovering from their devastating effects. Russia, for once, seemed to be in some kind of equilibrium, which, in Russian history of this time period, usually means that it's time for some kind of wrecking ball to come in and destroy everything. The Mountain Goats wrote a brilliant song, Heel Turn 2, about a move or a theatrical performance in professional wrestling, where tag teams are often used. A heel turn is when a wrestler who was previously part of one side switches sides suddenly and without warning. I'm not saying that Stalin was a pro wrestler, but almost as soon as Stalin was sure that he had seen off the united opposition, he executed a perfect heel turn and started to denounce the NEP. Having aligned himself with the right wing of the party, represented by Bukharin and fellow Politburo members Rykov and Tomsky, and united by their general support of the NEP, this was something of a surprise. Now the NEP, or the New Economic Policy, had been a success story, Under it, the Soviet economy had returned to the state it was before the Great War. Now that doesn't sound like a fantastic achievement, but it must be remembered that in that time they suffered a terrible military defeat by the Germans, then an intense civil war and revolution, and accompanying famines and diseases that killed millions. The fact that only three or four years after the fighting had stopped, the economy had returned to some semblance of what it was before the disaster was a major achievement. But the pace of change of industrialisation brought on by the NEP was too slow for Stalin and other leading Bolsheviks. This was for a few reasons. The Bolsheviks wanted to modernise the country, partly out of the idealism of socialism, and and partly so that Russia could defend herself in future wars. You also need to remember that their Marxist philosophy, where everyone is basically either a bourgeois landowner or an urban worker, had little room for Russia's agricultural economy, and so they needed Russia to become an industrial nation, and quickly, so that the revolution could go ahead. Stalin found his excuse to abandon the NEP with the grain crisis in 1927. Under the NEP, there was a small degree of capitalism, and so the government procured grain from the peasants while allowing them to sell off a surplus. But in 1927, the amount the government could obtain fell dramatically. A lot of this was down to Bolshevik meddling in the economy. While Bukharin and others supported the NEP, at least for now, for them it was always a temporary compromise, a little dose of capitalism to ease the transition into socialism. So the Bolshevik right wing tried to move gradually towards the centralised government control that they really wanted, and they did this by buying up flour mills and artificially lowering the price that they paid for grain. But the net result of the price fixing was just the disruption of the economy that led to the grain crisis, which in many ways gave Stalin just the chance he needed to execute his heel turn. The softly softly approach was over. This was begun in a trip to the farming regions of Siberia on Russia's famous Trans-Siberian Railway. Now incidentally, there's a famous story, although it's probably untrue, that the railway itself had a vast kink in it because the Tsar, when he drew the line on the map to denote where the railway was going to be, used a ruler with a little nick in it. Everyone, so the story goes, was too afraid of him to correct this error and proceeded to build the railway complete with kink. This is an anecdotal evidence about the perils of absolute power that goes unquestioned, and see in the dictionary under Stalin for more evidence of that. So, Stalin personally went to Siberia, had a brief look around, maybe had some awkward conversations with the girls he'd met while he was exiled there, and then blamed the grain crisis on kulaks, the wealthy class of peasants who sold their surpluses. They were hoarders, they were capitalists, and they were anti-Bolshevik, so Stalin had them rounded up and arrested en masse. Obviously, Stalin had no interest in genuinely resolving the crisis, but instead using it as an excuse to tighten control over the peasants. Or perhaps it just shows us the inherent paranoia of so many of the Bolsheviks. Failures are not down to accidents or bad policy, or even bad fortune. Everything is always sabotage. In the Kulaks, Stalin had an enemy to demonise. Volgokhanov, in his biography Stalin, Triumph and Tragedy, which interestingly was published just around the time the Soviet Union fell, points out that this was the only time that Stalin visited an agricultural region. He knew nothing of the lives of the peasants and the way that a bad harvest could make grain harder to obtain. Montefiore describes the pivot this way. Quote, 
Stalin was a natural radical, and now he shamelessly stole the clothes of the leftists he had just defeated. He and his allies were already talking of a new final revolution, the great turn leftwards to solve the problem of the peasantry and economic backwardness. These Bolsheviks hated the obstinate old worlds of the peasants. They had to be herded into collective farms, their grain forcibly collected and sold abroad to fund a malic gallop to create an instant industrial powerhouse that could produce tanks and planes. Private trade of food was stopped. Kulaks were ordered to deliver their grain and prosecuted as speculators if they did not. The villagers themselves were forced into collectives. Anyone who resisted was a Kulak enemy. End quote. In collectivization, the model of the peasantry as small-scale farmers who ate some of what they produced on their land and sold the surplus, or more often had their food requisitioned, was replaced. Farmers were deprived of their land, their animals, their equipment, and forced to work on larger collective farms. Now, the idea behind this was that there could eventually be mechanised farms, and they could be far more efficiently with tractors, growing the industrial as well as the agricultural economy, which is more difficult to do when everyone owns their own plot of land. But of course, in effect, the state was depriving the peasants of what little property they had. Collectivization was a forced process, with the volunteers such as 25,000 from industrial cities, forcing families to move onto collective farms. The overall food supply might have eventually been increased by abandoning these inefficient methods, but it was clear that this was not for the benefit of the peasants, who would own nothing. In effect, the Soviet state was attempting to reduce them back to a sort of red serfdom, with tight government controls and little private ownership. Montefiore quotes a young activist, Lev Kopolev, who took part in the grain raids that began the early part of collectivization. He says, quote, I was scouring the countryside, searching for hidden grain. I emptied out old folk's storage chests, stopping my ears to the children's crying and the women's wails. I was convinced that I was accomplishing the great and necessary transformation of the countryside. End quote. Those accused of being kulaks were divided into three categories. The first were shot straight away by a local branch of the secret police. The second were deported to Siberia with their property confiscated. And the third group were evicted from their homes and used as forced labour locally. A young lady from one of the collectivised villages provides a harrowing tale. In the interview which Orlando Fiege conducted and which you can access online, Antonina Golovina, whose father was arrested as a kulak, described what his life was really like. She would wake up at two or three in the morning to find him downstairs, doing odd jobs after a full day in the field harvesting grain. You know, these weren't the wealthy kulaks that Stalin portrayed them to be. This was what was necessary for families like hers to make ends meet, and by modern Western standards we'd think they're barely struggling to get by and yet they were still demonised as wealthy slackers and saboteurs. In reality, the reason he was called a kulak was because their family was just envied by others in the village for some reason or another. Just as during the Red Terror, the trigger-happy zealotry of local party officials provided a really great way for you to get revenge on people you didn't like. Just accuse them of being a kulak and, hey presto, problem solved. In Antonina's village, some of the more unscrupulous and jealous villagers became keen Komsomol activists, tasked with tracking down kulaks. They used to regularly enter her house and torment her father, accusing him of plotting against Soviet power, even as he tried to reason with them. One exchange grew heated and the party activist, who was just the head of a local family, said, quote, I killed your brother and got away with it, I can have you killed as well. Her father lost control at this and attacked the man. For that, he was caught up in dekulakization, arrested and sentenced to five years in the gulag. Antonina herself was deported to a new school, where even the teachers had no mercy. She recalls, and all of a sudden she started yelling at us, saying, You enemies of the people, wretched kulaks, you deserve to be deported. I hope you're all exterminated. Of course, we were all silent when she started calling us all sorts of things. And in the end, she just sent us home. I think it's really important to read some of these interviews because it's just fascinating to see how people look back on their lives and on so many things that seem unthinkable to us now, but that must have been normal then based on the way they discuss them. There was a terrible irony in discussing the human cost of these policies. The irony lies in the use of statistics. Of course, Stalin is supposed to have said that one death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic. I don't know if he actually said it, but it certainly sums up his attitude pretty well. When I want to explain the magnitude of the disruption caused by the five-year plans, that between four and six million kulaks were deported, arrested or executed, for example, I'm falling into the same trap that the Soviet leaders did. Individuals become replaced by statistics in some vast behemothic machine. Targets and numbers are everything. The reality behind what it means to have so many million tonnes of steel, or 80% of the farms collectivised in a year in the Ukraine, this is as unimaginable to me as it was to Stalin and others in the Politburo, who were divorced from the reality on the ground. I imagine, I hope, that it's unimaginable for most of you, as it is for me, to have agents of the government come to your home, accuse you of hoarding food, steal your possessions, break up your family, deport your father, your brother, your son. Stalin's comment on the policy of dekulakization, 
When the head is cut off, no one wastes tears on their hair. We can't comprehend the numbers. There was divorce from reality as the Soviet planners who dreamed of utopia and wrote down their dreams of 200% increases in production. There was far from a true understanding of the problem as Stalin was when he scribbled on his notepad, what is a kulak? There was vast disruption in the countryside, not only the general chaos that occurred due to the rapid pace at which collectivisation was forced on the peasants, but also due to passive resistance among the farmers. Collectivisation looked an awful lot like requisition to them. Many peasants viewed the Soviet government as the Antichrist, and, after all, at the same time as collectivising the farms, they were fighting their culture battle and attacking the churches, closing them down and seizing their property. If you were superstitious and politically unaware, it would look like the end of days. Better, then, to resist in any way you can, so there are stories of families destroying what little they possessed rather than letting it fall into the hands of the communists, or refusing to work on the new collective farms they'd been forced towards. Farm animals were killed, seized, or simply starved in the absence of anyone to feed them or anything to feed them with. It would take until the 1950s for the number of farm animals in the USSR to return to the levels before collectivization started. Now, the initial disruption was so dreadful and had such a negative impact that Stalin was forced to backtrack. He had the gall to publish this temporary halt to collectivization as an article under the title Dizzy with Success. Stalin wrote, The Soviet government's successes in the sphere of the collective farm movement are now being spoken of by everyone. Even our enemies are forced to admit that the successes are substantial, and they really are very great. But the successes have their seamy side, especially when they're attained with comparative ease, unexpectedly, so to speak. Such successes sometimes induce a spirit of vanity and conceit. We can achieve anything. There's nothing we can't do. People not infrequently become intoxicated by such successes. They become dizzy with success, lose all sense of proportion and the capacity to understand realities. They show a tendency to overrate their own strength and to underrate the strength of the enemy. Adventurous attempts are made to solve all questions of socialist construction in a trice. It cannot be said that these dangerous and harmful sentiments are widespread in the ranks of our party, but they do exist in our party, and there are no grounds for asserting that they will not become stronger. And if they should be allowed free scope, there can be no doubt that the collective farm movement will be considerably weakened, and the danger of its breaking down may become a reality. So Stalin's willing to accept that he's done something wrong, but in classic Stalin fashion, it is, we were just far too good at what we were doing. He later blames the forced collectivization on overzealous underlings. You just didn't explain it properly. But Stalin's apparent softening was just a temporary concession to political reality. He was a master of the temporary political retreat, followed by the subtle intensification of previous policies as time went on. Consider the dramatic series of fake resignations that he'd offered to Lenin whenever he didn't get his own way. In reality, despite the letter, collectivization didn't slow in pace. Widespread coercion was expanded. Between 1930 and 1, even after Dizzy with success, the percentage of farms that were collected farms doubled. If you had to use one word to describe Stalin's economic policy after this great heel turn when the NEP was abandoned, it would be force. Everything was to be done by force. The rhetoric became more brutal and vigorous than before. In a famous speech, Stalin said, quote, No, comrades, the pace must not be slackened. On the contrary, we must quicken it as much as within our powers and possibilities. To slacken the pace would mean to lag behind, and those who lag behind are beaten. The history of old Russia was that she was ceaselessly beaten for her backwardness. She was beaten by the Mongol Khans. She was beaten by the Turkish Bays. She was beaten by the Swedish feudal lords. She was beaten by the Polish-Lithuanian pans. She was beaten by Anglo-French capitalists. She was beaten by Japanese barons. She was beaten by all for her backwardness. We are 50 or 100 years behind the advanced countries. We must make good this lag in 10 years. Either we do it, or they crush us. Notice that there's no mention of the socialist dream of a utopian society with equality for all, but instead we've in fact moved away from that internationalism and towards a sort of Russian patriotism. Stalin is talking about himself like he's a new modern czar, that he is going to revolutionise old Russia. But there's nothing about the socialist state, it's all about competing with the capitalists. Alongside the persecution of the peasants and the seizing of the grain, in 1928, Stalin unveiled the economic policy that would replace the NEP, the first five-year plan. In the cities and industrial zones, the five-year plan was defined by targets. There were overall targets, some of which seemed wildly optimistic. Stalin demanded, for example, that production of coal should double, the production of iron should triple, the production of electricity should increase by 330%. To achieve this, every factory and every worker had their own individual targets. Every day, you'd go to work and find vast display boards listing the targets for every worker and for the factory overall. 
Any worker who failed to meet their industrial output targets was singled out for criticism and humiliation. If you continued to fail or tried to avoid showing up for work, you'd usually be accused of sabotage. Sentences varied. Usually this type of saboteur wasn't executed, but instead they'd be sent away to be a forced labourer. Which I suppose in some ways wasn't that different to what they were being forced to do at the moment. Vast public work projects like the Dnieper Dam and a railway between Turkey and Siberia were started. Alongside this, there was a vast expansion in repression. The secret police, now called the NKVD, set up a vast network of gulags, the forced labour camps to which all of the kulaks were deported. Millions of workers were detained in forced labour camps, and they became an integral part of the Soviet economy. The target culture began to pervade the entire system, set up by a vast bureaucracy that was often completely divorced from the reality on the ground. The central planning agency, Gosplan, essentially just drew up numbers. Stalin demanded a 110% increase in coal production, 200% increase in iron production, 235% increase in electric power. That's what they had to do. The plan insisted that the USSR should produce so many million tons of coal, so many million tons of steel, etc. No account was made for any natural economic variation or the laws of supply and demand. This was a centrally planned economy. The machines and new factories that would be required to fulfil these targets would be paid for by the export of grain collected from the peasants. Stalin said in a letter to Molotov, one of his key allies, Force the export of grain to a maximum. This is the core of everything. Targets were inextricably linked with Soviet propaganda. The idea of a Soviet economic miracle was paramount. Marxism-Leninism was such a perfect theory that it would surely produce this miracle. So targets were constantly being revised upwards. Individual factories and officials were constantly reporting them as being overfulfilled and proudly presenting surpluses. In the end, the central planners would declare that the first five-year plan had been fulfilled in just four years. As to whether it was really a success? Production increased, there's no doubt about that, and quite often in astonishing ways. Electricity production did nearly triple. Iron production went up by 50%. Production of coal and oil also nearly doubled, although... It's very difficult to know, given that the official figures probably are exaggerated by a great deal to ensure that everything was above target. Stalin himself would probably argue that, had the rapid industrialization not occurred, the USSR could not have assembled the vast war machine that resisted the Nazi invasion in 1941, and a lot of people, even in Russia today, agree with him. But of course, any centrally planned system was really very wasteful. Often the raw materials that were produced would just sit around in warehouses, with the machinery to use them not yet constructed. Draconian directives aimed at producing raw materials meant that many sectors of the economy were neglected and grew more slowly, especially those that refer to consumer goods and quality of life. You can't really have that when the focus is on iron, oil, steel, coal. And any economic gains that were made always came at an immense human cost. Beyond the millions of slave labourers who built the new cities, of whom 100,000 died building the Bellamore Canal alone, There were millions more ordinary workers who lived under the constant fear of being arrested or deported if they made mistakes, or failed to fulfil quotas. Real wages for industrial workers, whose revolution, after all, this was supposed to be, actually fell during the first five-year plan. The economic development was heavily unbalanced. On the face of it, there were some truly remarkable achievements, but they came at a terrible cost. Alongside the first five-year plans creating radical economic change in the USSR, there was a Stalinist drive to change the culture. Religion, for example, was seen as a symbol of Russian's backwardness that Stalin had so railed against. Now, they weren't subtle in the way they went after religion, because the organisation that did it was called the League of the Militant Godless. This was a volunteer organisation filled with party members and young Komsomol activists, funded by Stalin, and it underwent all kinds of activities aimed at exterminating religion, especially in the countryside. The League was like the Bolshevik party in miniature. Even amongst themselves, they were constantly suspicious that they were being infiltrated and undermined by people secretly harbouring religious beliefs, and they'd discuss their concerns about fellow members. Propaganda that trumpeted scientific achievements and atheist views, and attacked religion as backwards and religious organisations as enemies of the state, was disseminated, and the League was involved in the arrest and often execution of bishops and priests, who were viewed as obstacles to the New World Order. Because, after all, they were people who could be listened to, who spoke with a higher authority than the party. To quote the group itself, All religions, no matter how much they renovate and cleanse themselves, are systems of the idea, profoundly hostile to the idea of socialism. Religious organisations are in reality political agencies, of class groupings hostile to the proletariat. End quote. So this is a fairly familiar idea that religion is the opiate of the masses, as Marx would have said. It's an instrument of control, class warfare, but at the same time, if you go after religion, it's profoundly against the people who believe in that religion. And we will see later on that Stalin has to concede on this policy at certain times in his reign.
By 1931, the League of the Militant Godless had 5.5 million members. They also made it a priority to remove religious icons from the homes of believers. By 1940, over 100 bishops, tens of thousands of Orthodox clergy, and thousands of monks and lay believers had been killed or died in Soviet prisons in the Gulag. Their slogan was the storming of heaven. So this was a far cry then, from the choir boy of Gory and Tiflis spiritual ceremony where Stalin had grown up. Their assault on religion is indicative of the twin approach of the Soviet regime, destroying any organisation that might dissent and replacing existing power structures with their own versions. Stalin and the Bolsheviks were culture warriors. To establish their paradise, the destruction and replacement of all the old order had to be achieved. Perhaps with just a shade of the old poet from his high school days showing, Stalin took a special interest in the literary arts. Writers were no longer just writers, however. They were engineers of the human soul. Stalin, displaying his classic micromanagement tendencies, would personally read and correct manuscripts from the Union of Soviet Writers. Eventually, he had a set of pet writers that were producing pro-Soviet propaganda pieces that glorified the state and socialism. Yet, interestingly, censorship was not always absolute. Take the example of Mikhail Shokolov, who became a prominent writer in the Soviet canon and frequently met with Stalin. He wrote a novel, The Virgin Soil Upturned, about the policy of collectivization, and, while it was broadly supportive of the policy's aims, it did not always shy away from some of the more brutal realities of it. Shokolov had a conscience. Robert Service remarks, Shokolov was not a servile hack. He was horrified by what he witnessed in the countryside, as many Cossacks were brutally herded into collective farms. Repeatedly, he wrote to Stalin pointing this out. As famine grew in southern Russia, the correspondence became heated. Sholokov's letters testified to his courage. Stalin's engagement with him signals a recognition that loyalist intellectuals provided a useful function for him by raising difficult questions without ever threatening his political position. Stalin would never allow a politician to get away with such impertinence. End quote. Maxim Gorky was another novelist who frequently visited Stalin. Broadly speaking, we think he was duped into believing the Soviet propaganda about constructing a better society, and he even wrote glowing prose about events like the construction of the White Sea Canal, which we now know was a humanitarian disaster. In return, Gorky was granted a large literary allowance and lived in luxury, with a mansion in Moscow, a dacca outside the capital, and a villa in the Crimea. Gorky provided the regime with intellectual cover, writing in Pravda, If the enemy does not surrender, he must be exterminated. The enemy he referred to was the hated Kulaks. Stalin's personal literary tastes often came into conflict with what he thought was good for the regime. For example, from his school days, he loved Dostoevsky, but censored his works because they were bad for the young people. He personally admired the works of satirists like Zoshenko, who mocked Soviet bureaucracy, and would read them to his children, remarking with a brutal sense of humour, here's where the author remembered the secret police and changed the ending. Incidentally, Stalin's own poetry was censored until late on in his life. This is likely due to its sympathy with Georgian nationalism, more than due to its flowery imagery that might have been a bit embarrassing. By 1932-3, the policy of collectivization and the mismanagement of resources had reached critical point in the Ukraine and the surrounding areas. The Soviet authorities pr procured a falling amount of grain from the region, and so they restricted the rations that were given to the Ukrainians by the state. The result was one of the most appalling events in modern history, a widespread famine known as the Holodomor. Many people, especially those who were affected, believed that this man-made famine was an intentional weapon of war by the Soviet state to destroy Ukrainian nationalism in particular, and to break the will of the peasants more generally. Stalin himself accused the peasants of launching a war of starvation against the state by withholding grain. And really, what has he done so far that makes you think he wouldn't use those tactics himself? As the people starved, no attempt was made by the authorities to alleviate the situation. They continued to collect enough grain to fill their quotas for export. It was exported and sold abroad in order to pay for the rapid industrialisation Stalin demanded. In 1932-3, according to Michael Elman, enough grain was exported by the Ukraine alone to feed 5 million people for a year. Half of that grain was exported long after the authorities had received reports of famine. Given those facts, it seems there's no question that the famine could have been prevented if it was a priority for the Soviets. Again, you can get obsessed with statistics. No one can agree on the exact numbers of deaths due to the lack of official records and attempted cover-up. All scholars agree, however, that millions of people died from the famine. But I'm not going to go with statistics, and instead I'm going to read out some first-hand accounts from people who were there. Here's one. On March 28th, 1933, we were shocked by the news that Miron Yemets and his wife Maria had become cannibals. Having cut off their children's heads, they salted them away for meat. The neighbours smelled meat frying and the smoke coming from their chimney, and, noticing the absence of children, went into the house. When they were asked about the children, the parents began to weep and told the whole story. The perpetrators of this act said that they would have children again, 
otherwise they would die in great pain, and that would be the end of the family. Chairman Boyko arrested them himself, and about six hours later the police came to question them. Who has so cunningly persuaded you to do this? You know that this is the work of our enemies, to cast dishonour upon our country, the Soviet Union, the most advanced country in the world? You have to tell us who did it. Hoping to save themselves in this way, the accused pointed to Pablo Litvinenko, who was supposed to have said, If you have nothing to eat, butcher the children and eat them. Litvinenko was arrested and shot as an example to the others. Myron and Maria were sentenced to ten years in prison. However, they were shot about three months later because the Soviet government was ashamed to let them live. At the end of March or the beginning of April, a big department store was opened in Hadyach on Polyevsk Street, by the park, across the street from Lenin's monument. It was called Torksin. Stocked very well, even with goods from abroad, it had one fault, that of selling only for platinum, gold, silver, or precious stones. The prices were, for ten gold rubles, one could buy their seventeen pounds of bread, twenty-two pounds of buckwheat cereal, six and two-third pounds of millet, and ten herrings. As soon as people had learned about this, all who had any gold or silver flocked to the city. There was a line, eight abreast and a third of a mile long, in front of the store. There were always fifty to seventy people who could not get in before the store closed for the day. They spent their nights on the sidewalk, disregarding cold, storm or rain. Thefts were very common, but most died from hunger or stomach cramps after eating too much and too greedily the food they bought. The corpses were removed every morning by a police truck. I also stood in line with my mother. There I saw with my own eyes ten dead being thrown onto the truck like so many logs, and in addition three men that were still alive. The dead were hauled to Hilboki Yar, deep ravine, and dumped there. The department store had its good and bad sides. The Russians robbed the people of practically all the gold they had. On the other hand, it saved many people's lives because six to eleven pounds of grain saved one from starving to death. Those who had no gold for food dropped like flies or went to the cemeteries in search of corpses. The most critical point was reached just before the harvest. More and more people starved to death each day. Everything was eaten that could be swallowed. Dogs, cats, frogs, mice, birds, grass, but mostly thistles, which were delicious if the plants were about 15 inches high and cleaned of spines. Many people went to graze, and often died in the grazing fields. The Soviet elite were fully aware of what was going on, and they were callous about it. Stalin wrote in a letter to Kaganovich, The Ukraine has been given more than it should get. When officials began reporting the famine to Stalin, he said to one of them, They tell us you're a good speaker, but it transpires you're a good storyteller too, fabricating such a fairy tale about famine. You thought you'd scare us, but it won't work. Perhaps you should leave the Ukrainian Central Committee and join the Reuters Union. You'll concoct fables and fools will read them. End quote. But the physical evidence of the famine was undeniable. As Stalin and his fellow elites went on luxury trains to holiday at their dakas, they could see the result of the policies dreamed up in Kremlin offices. One of Stalin's allies wrote, Looking at the people from the windows of the trains, I see very tired people in old worn clothes, and our horses are skin and bone. Here is Ayana Tuchinyuk's account of the death of her neighbour's six-year-old son, Mityo. Yana was born in 1905 in the village of Subotiv in the Chichen region. Quote, He was on his way to the kindergarten one morning when the collective farm was distributing a serving of millet meal the size of a matchbox, and he dropped by begging, Auntie, give me a piece of bread, I'm so hungry. I didn't give him any because I was mad at him for eating the greens I'd planted in the garden. To the day I die, I will not forgive myself for begrudging the child a piece of bread. In the evening, on our way from home from work, we found him sitting up in the middle of the footpath, dead. He was probably returning from the kindergarten, had got tired, sat down, and died. Antonina Polishchuk, born in 1925. She lived in the village of Bukata, in the Likansky region. In 1933... Our mother pretended to sow some dolls for the children, filling them with grain so that they would not take all the grain away from us. But they found the grain even there and seized it. They took our ox away and killed it, taking the meat for themselves. End quote. Tetiana Vodichensko, born in 1911, lived in the same village. It happened that they took people who were still alive and would throw them into common graves. This happened with Kochina Rebenko. When they came to her house, she was still alive. They started dragging her by the feet. Where were you pulling me to? Give me a beat. I'm hungry. I still want to live. She was young, not yet 30. You think we're going to come back for you tomorrow? growled the men in response, pulling her onto a cart by her feet. They brought her to the gravesite and threw her inside. She did not fall on her back, but propped up in a sitting position, her back against the side. They poked at her head, and she finally fell back. End quote. Stepanidia Hodorovina, born in 1905, from the village of Shabianko in the region by the same name. She said, In 1933, my neighbour lured my daughter to my house, killed her with a knife and ate her. 
My daughter was all of six years old at the time. When the beast was seized and taken to prison, she kept taking out slices of meat and eating them, saying, Mmm, how tasty. Had I known, I would have killed her earlier. The police could not tolerate this any longer, and they shot her right there on the road. Timothy Snyder wrote in his book Bloodlands, summarising the Holodomor. Quote, Survival was a moral, as well as a physical struggle. A woman doctor wrote to her friend in June 1933 that she had not yet become a cannibal, but was not sure that I shall not be one by the time my letter reaches you. The good people died first. Those who refused to steal or to prostitute themselves died. Those who gave food to others died. Those who refused to eat corpses died. Those who refused to kill their fellow man died. Parents who resisted cannibalism died before their children did. End quote. Years later, Stalin had a conversation with Churchill where he described this. He said, We took the greatest trouble explaining collective farms to the peasants. It was no use arguing with them. It was all very bad and difficult, but necessary. Many of them agreed to come in with us, but the vast bulk were unpopular and were wiped out by their labourers. End quote. Rewriting history is easy enough when you don't have to live through the worst of it yourself. Stalin and his allies sat in offices, scrawling memos, divorcing themselves from the reality of the implementation of their idealistic policies. In reality, they were betraying the ideals of fairness and equality that socialism espoused. Whether it was to establish their paradise, or simply to maintain a hold on power, they were willing to accept any cost. It's just that it would fall to others to pay that price for them. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you've enjoyed Autocracy Now, please leave us a review or rate us on iTunes. I know that everyone always says this, but it's the best way to get us noticed, without me having to stand on my roof with a megaphone 24-7. You can visit our website at www.autocracynow.wordpress.com or www.autocracynow.libsyn.com. You can email the show at autocracynow at outlook.com, follow us on Twitter and Facebook, and even donate to the show if you like. Tell your friends, tell your enemies... Next episode, I'm going to loop back around and deal with the developments in Stalin's personal and political life between 1929 and 33, as the vast economic and social changes in the Soviet Union were taking place. Now, the times were so complicated and we have so much detail about them that I don't feel I can combine everything into a chronological narrative. So keep in mind that as these personal events occur, the political occur at the same time. Which is in the foreground and which is in the background probably depends on your perspective. We will discuss the changing of the guard between his old allies of convenience like Buhalin and a new set of loyalists, and we will discuss the unhappy fate of Nadja Stalin.